Hi, my name is Suzanne Johnson and I'm a gynaecologist from Southampton. This is a short presentation on the practical implementation of the risk of malignancy prediction systems from the IATA group. Imaging of the ovaries is really important to help predict the risk of malignancy in an exome mass. We can diagnose ovarian cancer earlier and enable women with a malignancy to have surgery in a dedicated oncology centre. We can also triage women with benign pathology to a benign gynaecology service, potentially for conservative management or for minimally invasive surgery. The report really matters whether or not the next lesion is benign or malignant. Here is an example of some recent pelvic masses that I scanned. And in the olden days, the report would say something like a simple cyst or a complex cyst. But we don't like the word complex now because it means nothing. It's just the opposite of simple. Can we do better with the IOTA systems? Can we say whether something is normal or functional, benign, borderline, invasive or metastatic to the ovary? NHS England recently published this timed gynecological cancer diagnostic pathway and in that they talk about urgent pelvic ultrasound either in primary care or in a local diagnostic centre. The transvaginal ultrasound should be carried out by a specialist practitioner based on the IOTA standards. So what are these IOTA standards? The IOTA group, um, the International Ovarian Tumor Analysis Group, gave us terms and definitions of adnexal pathology uh, all done on transvaginal ultrasound, not on transabdominal ultrasound. And this paper was published in 2000. Um, they gave us a language with which to describe adnexal lesions. So standardised language, and then they've gone on to give us models for a risk of malignancy prediction, such as easy descriptors, simple rules, adnex, and more recently, the ORADS model and management system. Easy descriptors are basically pattern recognition, and about half of all adnexal masses are usually instantly recognisable. For instance, in premenopausal women, a cyst that would be physiological, or maybe a dermoid cyst, an endometrioma, or a simple cyst or cyst adenoma. And particularly in postmenopausal women, something that looks like a malignant tumour with ascites. When easy descriptors don't apply, then the IOTA group gave us simple rules from a paper published in 2008. And there are benign features and malignant features. And so if a lesion is unilocular, less than 10 centimetres with no solid component, that would be a benign feature. Another benign feature is shadowing behind the lesion or a feature of the smooth multilocularity of less than 10 centimetres is a benign feature. The presence of a tiny solid component is a benign feature and if there is no vascularity. All these are benign features and the lesion would be categorised as benign if there are one or more of these benign features and no malignant features. The malignant features a lesion might show is if it's irregular and solid or if there are at least four papillary structures. If the lesion is irregular and multilocular with a solid component and more than 10 centimetres in size, if there is ascites and if there is very strong blood flow, all these are malignant features. And so the lesion is classified as malignant if there are one or more malignant features in the absence of benign features. So the simple rules are again just said like that. Um, the third rule is that the result is inconclusive if you have both malignant and benign features or neither. And this is what we have pinned up in our scan room, the benign features and the malignant features. And you can just tick them off and categorize a mass as benign, malignant or uncertain, inconclusive. There's an app for this as well for simple rules. And there's a poster that we also have in our scan room. So how good are the simple rules? If it says categorically it's benign or malignant, it has very high sensitivity and specificity. The thing is they're uncertain or inconclusive in 25% of cases. So in those cases, what do you do next? When simple rules are inconclusive, you can either treat all of these as malignant because nearly half of them are, or you can have the person scanned again by an expert, or you can um, apply the ADNEX risk model. And this was published in 2014, again by the IOTA group, and it showed you how to do this. And we looked at uh, six different ultrasound features of the lesion and include in the model the patient's age, 
whether she was scanned in an oncology center or other, and an optional CA125 test. And this is the way the model looks online or again on your phone and you go through that and then press calculate and it will give you the chance of that lesion being benign or of it being malignant. And so the benign and malignant, of course, add up to 100. If it's uh, thought to be malignant, it will uh, tell you whether it's likely to be borderline, stage one, stage two to four or a metastatic tumour to the ovary. Um, you then choose a cutoff for distinguishing between benign and malignant. So this is more than 10%. So we would categorize this lesion as malignant. Um, these slides are from Professor Tom Bourne's presentation at a recent ISUOG World Congress. And it shows you for the different cutoffs what the sensitivity and specificity is. And the IOTA group usually recommends a cutoff of 10%. If you then compare simple rules and adnex to the RMI, which is, of course, the old style test, um, here is the RMI and here are uh, adnex and the simple rules. And you can see that the area under the curve is uh, far greater. It's a much better test, simple rules and adnex. And this is a different way of looking at the same thing. You can see that the risk of malignancy index doesn't do very well, uh, but adnex does far better. Then in 2020, uh, with a collaboration from the IOTA group, and another series of papers was published on ORADS. Um, and ORADS is an international system, again, looking at the risk of malignancy, but looking at diagnosis and management suggestions. So it combines pattern recognition with the IOTA terminology, and they've got their own slightly different uh, lexicon, uh, and using the ADNEX risk prediction model as well. That knowledge is condensed into six categories of risk, all based on previous IOTA work. Um, so they're complementary. The ADNEX gives you a risk of malignancy and a possible stage, and if it's primary or metastatic. And ORADS also gives you suggested management. Um, you can print that chart, and again, we've done that in our scan room, uh, or you can get it on an app uh, by scanning those QR codes. So how do we use the systems? When we start to scan a lesion, we look to see, is it categorizable using easy descriptors as benign or malignant? And just doing that will categorize accurately half of the adnexal lesions. For those that don't fit an easy descriptor, we can use simple rules and divide lesions into whether they're benign or malignant on simple rules. And just using that, we've now categorized 75% on all adnexal lesions. When the simple rules are uncertain, we apply ADNEX and come up with a risk of malignancy. Um, and you can then put the ADNEX risk score into the, uh, into the ORADS chart and come up with a management suggestion. So you can see that the time of calling all these lesions complex is gone. We don't use, call, we don't use the word complex at all anymore. And we've been able to categorize all of these lesions um, as I've listed here. So how do we use this? Um, I set up a pelvic mass clinic in Southampton in 2012, and I scan all the ovarian referrals to the two-week weight pathway, patients with a pelvic mass or ascites or a raised CO125. All my scans are done using IOTA language and IOTA risk models. I usually have about six patients a session of 40 minutes each, and in that time I have to do quite a lot. I take a history, perform the transvaginal ultrasound, save the images, report the scan in CRIS, calculate the risk of malignancy using easy descriptors, simple rules or adnex, and make a management plan. So I triage patients with a benign lesion out to benign gynecology, but keep the patients with, uh, with uncertain features or a frankly malignant lesion to the two-week weight pathway. I discuss what I've done with the patient and request a CT and TA125 if necessary. I might then also enroll patients in a research study like ROCKETS uh, and email the two-week wait and ET team about the triage plan. Um, so I see about 25 patients a month and we audit this, uh, the safety and the efficiency of doing this every few years. And in 2014, about 43% of the two-week wait patients were triaged out safely to benign gynecology. By 2016, it was 47% were triaged out to benign gynecology. Um, and currently, I triage out at least half of all two-week weight ovarian patients into benign gynecology because the quality of the two-week weight referrals has gone down a bit. 
and this is an example of the 2016 audit. So to set up such a pelvic mass clinic, we haven't had any special funding, but I think that we're saving money uh, and it's safe because we're using published iota risk of malignancy models and I uh, check up for all the histology that, uh, that it later comes to light. I've trained at least two other sonologists in my unit and their senior gynecologists who each already had the RCOG intermediate gynecology ultrasound qualification. We've done hands-on training. Um, other people who might be able to run such a clinic though would be a radiologist with a special interest in gynecology ultrasound or a sonographer specialized in gynecology ultrasound. The main thing is training, whether it's a sonographer, a sonologist or a radiologist, training is crucial. And there are a lot of online resources. There are IOTA courses and online learning at iotagroup.org. There are online videos at my website, gynecologyultrasound.com, and mentorship probably would pay, uh, play an important role. Also important to leave enough time for the examination, so just to start with four patients per clinic. Thank you.